Congressional Budget Office saying that it sees the federal budget deficit uh, dropping by $190 uh, billion dollars this year. Um, that's the good news. The bad news, it projects that deficits uh, will climb over the next decade from $1.6 trillion this year to $2.6 tr trillion uh, in 2034. Join us now, CBO Director uh, Philip Swagel. Uh, why? That is, I thought it was going to be two trillion this year. So why is it 1.6? What what happened positively? Uh, we'll start with that with some good news, uh, Phil. Okay, Joe. Yeah, no, thanks so much. It's it's nice to be able to deliver some good news. Um, so there are two things. One is that there's a bunch of revenue that by um, actions of the Biden administration was delayed from 2023 into 2024. And there's like, think of California wildfire disasters and then the corporate minimum tax that um, the, the guidance wasn't provided uh, by the IRS last year. So that's one. And then the Fiscal Responsibility Act that was enacted last year that um, slowed the growth of discretionary spending. So as a mix of those two things, improved the fiscal outlook for this year. No way. So you mean that was the thing McCarthy negotiated, at, at one of his final things with, with the Biden administration, that the, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, so that actually worked a little? Yeah. So over 10 years, we project that that will reduce the deficit by $2.6 trillion. That includes the, the caps on discretionary spending and then projecting that out and then the lower debt service cost from the lower discretionary spending. That's interesting. For that, he got, <laughs> for that he got ousted. Phil, uh, it, it, the, we don't have to do, you're not even uh, including any uh, big spending increases, new programs. You're talking about purely debt service gets us to $2.6 trillion by 2034 a year. That's, that's right. So our baseline is current law. And so additional spending or tax relief, anything um, that would increase the deficit from what we have, from the 2.6 that, that you mentioned. We had a couple of years of, of flat stock market performance, and, and obviously you don't get the, the tax revenues from that. Is that a positive, that, that we're seeing some new highs uh, every day in the averages? So will we see that reflected anywhere? It will be a positive, um, both for the effect on the economy, that uh, higher wealth from higher asset prices you know, means more spending, more investment. It also means more capital gains uh, revenues. Now, we don't know when those will come in, but over time there's a, a positive correlation between asset prices and those, uh, those capital gains revenues. Hey, Phil, I'm curious uh, about what, you're, what, what you think of what the IRS has recently said and what we've seen in a bunch of reports about the amount of money that we should be collecting that we're not collecting, and whether you think either a combination of both more enforcement and other tools to allow people to pay in a more efficient way will actually increase the amount of money and revenue that, that the government collects that they're already entitled to. Oh, yeah. So we have some of that in our baseline projections, that the resources provided to the IRS in the 2022 Reconciliation Act will, over time, help them hire more revenue agents and improve their technology. That will have a, a, a return. We see about a two-to-one return on that. You know, they in, in invest or spend a dollar, they get two dollars in revenue, and so there's a net of one. Um, the IRS has put out some research, and the Treasury put out research, suggesting that the return will be much higher. You know, the service has been um, finding it very difficult to hire those revenue agents. So uh, it could be they get there, but, but there's a long time path uh, in front of them. So you think, so just, just to be clear about it, you think it's worth hiring some of the agents, none of the agents, more of the agents? And the agents, by the way, just to be clear about it, some people think a revenue agent is an enforcement agent that's going to your house to, to knock on your door. And I think part of it is that because there's sort of a deterrence effect that you're, you're hoping to create. But part of it is just literally, you know, from a technology perspective, making the whole system uh, work better and therefore effectively, hopefully, collecting more money that way. No, that's right. And, and it's a good point you make that uh, the hiring by the IRS is on a wide, um, you know, range of activities at, at the customer service. And then they really focused on that last year, technology, the revenue agents. And the IRS interacts with people by mail, um, you know, sometimes in person. There's lots of different ways. It's going to take them time to deploy the resources that they've been provided by the Congress. They really focused hard on customer service last year. It's helpful for Americans. It doesn't do as much on the revenue. So that's why, you know, our view is it's just going to take them longer 
uh, to get those revenue returns, so, I think, so then they, they say. I'm going to give you the power of the pen uh, to balance the budget by 2034. Tell me, what, what, what do we need to do? Uh, you know, so I think of two horizons. Then in the near term, the risk is net interest payments. You know, we have a pretty moderate path of interest rates. You know, the risk is, well, it could go in either direction, but higher interest rates, given the mounting debt, would, you know, mean a much larger deficit in the near term. Over time, it's mandatory spending. It's Social Security, it's health care. We're an aging society. We have still rapidly growing health care costs. You know, some, on the spending side, it's those mandatory spending, or on the revenue side, there's you know lots of options on revenues. It, well, okay, with revenue, you got to worry about you know you, you go up too much, then you you know you might hurt economic growth. I don't know if the CBO or any you know maybe with AI you could do it accurately. I'm, I'm not sure, but the the elephant in the room is is what you just said the mandatory spending. So there's a way to do it, but no political will to do it, and it's, it's the third rail. What would you do? What, what, would you raise the retirement age? for, for so what, what would you do? How would you do it? How would you bring Medicare and, and those entitlements uh, more in line with what we're able to afford? Yeah, so I would point viewers to a report we put out in December 2022 that's budget options. It's a list of ways to reduce the deficit. And in that, we have 17 large options. On the spending side, on the revenue side, each of those would be large enough to make an impact. And, you know, I, I wouldn't tell policymakers what to do, but that's, you know, part, that's, they that's the menu. They won't listen anyway, Phil. They won't listen anyway. <laughs> you know, none of, the, the, the challenge is that the, the options are all difficult, right? You're cutting spending for someone. You're raising taxes on someone. You know, there's no, there's no free lunch here. So we're stuck at, if we're, would you settle for 2.6 trillion in 2034? I, I think it's going to be much worse, don't you? You know, we project the deficit under current law. If there's new tax relief and there's new spending, the deficit could be larger. Okay. And, and that will, did, did you do the math on the, what the total debt will be by, by then and as a percentage of GDP? Yeah, so the debt rises to a, a new record and we're, we're ending up above, is like 116% of GDP by the end of the budget window, which is a, an all-time record.